Hello and good afternoon guys, welcome to MK Community Broker channel, my name is Mohammed. Uh, in this video guys, I'm going to go over uh, some of the terms or basic terms if you plan to become a let's say a property casualty broker or a life insurance agent. There's certain terminology you're supposed to follow, uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain to you certain terminology so hopefully when you guys do take the property casualty broker or the life, in life uh, insurance uh, broker or maybe a personal line broker slash agent, any of those fields, uh, so these terminology can help you out. So let's get started. So let's talk about risk management key terms. So what is a risk? Risk is an uncertainty ch or change of loss occurring. There are two types of risk. There's pure risk and, sp uh, and sp speculative risk. Pure risk refers to a situation that can only be resolved in a loss or no change. Uh, speculative risk involves the opportunity for either loss or gain. Example of speculative risk is gambling. I mean, you don't know if you're going to win, you don't know if you're going to lose. That's speculative risk. What is hazards? Uh, hazards are conditions or situations that increases the probability of an insured loss occurring. So, for example, slippery fall is one of them. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, like, let's say, for example, if, if, the, if, if the roof ceiling you'll see is breaking and, and if somebody walks in and breaks, that's considered as a hazard. So, there's three types of hazards, guys. It's physical hazard moral hazard and morale keep this in mind these are very important because these, these do, do t come in the test so physical hazards are those arising from material structure or any type of uh, or like let's say for example uh, if you're walking down and something falls on you that could be physical because something fell on you moral hazard refers to those applications that may lie on an application for insurance in the past have submitted fraud and claim against an insurer so anyone that does fraud or anything like that that's basically moral Morale hazard refers to an increase in the hazard presented by a risk, rising from the insurer's indifference of a loss because of the existence of an insurance. Example, I'm not going to bother to fixing this. If it breaks, my insurance will pay it replaces. That's morale. So keep that in mind. Let's say if you have a broken sidewalk outside of your home and uh, you don't fix it, guess what? You're going to be responsible for it. And that's morale. So more, that's physical, moral, and morale. There's three types of hazards. So what is pearl? Also very important, they might ask you in the test. Pearls are the causes of loss insured against for an insurance policy. So there's uh, life insurance uh, against the financial loss caused by the premature death of the insured. Uh, health insurance insures against the medical expense or loss of uh, income caused by insured sickness or accidental injury. Casualty insurance uh, insures against the loss or damage of, proper, of property and resulting liabilities. So basically, pearls are causes. So there's like lightning is one of the pearls. Fire is one of them. These are also additions what I read, but there's all different type of pearls as well. So going to page number three, loss. So loss is defined as a reduction, decrease, or disappearance of value of the personal property insured in the policy, caused by a name pearl. Insurance provides a means to transfer loss. So any type, whenever a loss happens, it's usually caused by a pearl. So keep that in mind. Exposures is the unit of measure to determine the rate charges for insurance coverage. In life insurance, all these following factors are considered to in determination rates. The age of the insured, medical history, occupation, and sex. So keep that in mind. A large number of units having, this, uh, having the, the same or similar exposure to loss is known as homogeneous. The basis of insurance by sharing risk among the members of a large homogeneous group with similar exposure to loss. So as you can see, hazards per loss in insurance. Now, avoidance. One of the methods of dealing with uh, risk is avoidance, which means eliminating exposure to a loss. For example, if a person wanted to avoid the risk of being killed in an airplane crash, you should might should never to fly an airplane. That's what avoidance is. You're avoiding something in order for it not to happen. For example, getting in a car accident. If you have a car, I mean, you like say and you never drive it, you're avoiding it because obviously you're never going to get into an accident. Retention. Risk retention is a planned assumption of risk by insured through the use of deductible, co-payments, or self-insurance. Some of the examples over here is to reduce expense and improve cash flow, to, to increase controls of claim reserving and claim settlement, and to fund of losses that cannot be insured. So basically it's also known as self-insurance. You basically accept the responsibility for the loss before the insurance company pays. So that's what the purpose of retention is. Sharing. So going to the next page, sharing is a method of dealing with risk for a group of individual, person or business within the same or similar exposure to loss. To share the losses that occur within that group. 
So basically, let's say for example, if the people uh, uh, in a group of people buy, uh, let's say, an errors and emission policy, which protects a customer or let's say a person from uh, making a mistake, or let's say medical malpractice, a common actually has it much easier than ENO. If, if doctors, what they do is they pool insurance. And, if, and, and basically they have one company. We're giving an example. And if one of the doctors, let's say, make a mistake, let's say accidentally kills a patient, it was supposed to save, uh, the all, they, because of them all pooling into one company, that company will protect that doctor because everyone's actually the same company. So that's where basically you can say sharing is. It's. Reduction, since we usually cannot avoid entirely, risk entirely, we often attempt to lessen the possibility of severity of loss. Reduction would include actions such as installing small detectors in our homes so that's part of reduction you're basically doing something extra or let's say if you have a dog that uh that let's say a guard dog you're putting extra fences around it so that the dog does not bite that's considered as reduction uh let's say transfer uh the most effective way to handle risk is to transfer it so the loss is borne by another party uh, insurance company is one of the most example Let's say, for example, somebody's about to sue you. You have insurance, right? The insurance will cover you. That's for transfer. You blame. You you're transferring the blame to the not blame blaming, but you're transferring your responsibility for you. What you're gonna pay out to the insurance company. That's what basically transfer is. Uh, elements of insurable risk, right over here. Not all risks are insurable. As noted earlier, insurers will only insure only pure risk or those that involve only the chances of loss, with no chances of gain. Furthermore. Even pure risk that may have certain characteristic in order to insurable, uh, insurable risk involve the following characteristic. For example, due to chance, a loss that is outside the insurer's control, definite and measurable, a loss that is specific as to cost, time, place, and amount, statistically predictable, non-catastrophic, insurers need to be reasonable certain their losses will not exceed specific limits, randomly selected and large loss exposure, there must be a sufficiently large pool insured that represents a random selection. Going to the next page of risk in terms of age, gender, occupation. So what is, what that basically is supposed to mean is simple. If you're if you're basically let's say for example, uh, is something certain insurance companies will not pay every insurance, and there's reasons for it. Let's say for example, if there's a, a a catastrophic event where all the homes are destroyed, no, not a single home is not saved. There is obviously a chance where the insurance company will not pay because it's, it was a catas uh, catastrophic event where it was un un you know, not in their controls and obviously it's too much of a damage where they can't really do anything about it. So keep that in mind. Certain, certain things are not covered by insurance. Not everything is covered. So keep that in mind. Like having flood insurance. If you don't have flood insurance, the ho homeowner insurance is not going to cover it. So keep that in mind. Not everything will be covered. Just thinking you have a homeowner or any type of insurance, not you have to do your own research a little bit. So the law of large number. I, no, I apologize. Adverse selection number four. Now, adverse selection is basically insurance companies strive to protect themselves from adverse selection. Basically, the insuring of risks that are more prone to losses other than the average risk. Poorer risk tends to seek insurance or file claim to a greater extent than better risk. Now, law of large numbers. The basis of law large number is basically insurance is sharing risk among a large group of people with a similar exposure or loss. The law of large number states that the larger the number of people with a similar exposure to loss, the more predictable actual losses will be. So that's what the law of large number is. So to give you an example, I'll read an example to you guys. When an insurance company issues a policy on a 35 year old male, the company really has no way of knowing or accurately predicting when he will die. Common sense. However, the law large number looked at a large group of people, similar to the 35-year-old male of similar life and health condition, which makes some conclusion based on statistics of past losses. This allows insurance company to have a general idea how long this person will live and what will happen. That's what the law, uh, this example is. The insurers, well, insur insurance is available from both private companies and the government. The major difference between the government and private is that the government programs are funded with taxes. And, s and serve national and social, uh, uh, state social purposes, while private companies are funded by premiums. Private insurance companies can be classified in a variety of ways. It could be an ownership, authority to transit business, location, marketing and distribution system, or rating financial strength. Stock companies. Now, stock companies are owned by the stockholders. 
who provide the capital necessary to establish and operate the insurance company and will share in any profit or losses. Officers are elected by the stockholders and manage stock insurance companies. Traditionally, stock companies issue non-participating policy in which policy owners do not share in profit or losses. Keep that in mind. Mutual companies. Mutual companies are owned by the policy owners and issue participant policies. While participant policy policy owners are entitled to dividends, which in the cause of mutual companies are to return to excess premium and are therefore not taxable, dividends are generated when the premium and the earning combined exceeds the actual cost of providing coverage, creating a surplus. Let's go over here, Fraternal Benefit Society. A Fraternal Benefit Society is an organization formed to provide insurance benefit for members of an affiliated lodge, religious organization or fraternal organization with a representation form of government. Private versus government insurers. A federal and state government provide insurance in areas where private insurance is not available called social insurance program. Government insurance program includes social security, Medicaid, Medicaid, federal corp insurance, and national flood insurance. So these are flood ins uh, government flood insurance, government entities where government will provide you well, you know, with with set amount of uh, you know insurance companies that a regular private company don't provide. The major difference between the government program and private insurance government is that the government programs are funded with the taxes, as stated before, and and serve national and state social purposes. Admitted versus non-admitted insurance. Before insurance transact business in a specific state, uh, they must apply for and be granted a license or a certificate of authority from the state department of insurance meet a financial capital and surplus requirement set by the state. Uh, they are also considered as authorized and admitted and non unauthorized and non admitted. Basically certain insurance companies, let's say for example if you live in New York State, I'll give you an excellent example. The company that you see that works in New York State, they are admitted. They are authorized and admitted. Uh, if you don't see them in New York State, let's say for example if you see them uh, from a uh, Let's say from Lords of London, perfect. They are operated in, Lon uh, in, in Great Britain, insurance is over there. They're unauthorized or non admitted insurance company. So basically because they're not here, they're not authorized. So keep that in mind. They're considered as surplus line brokers or surplus line insurance companies. So that's one part as well. Uh, obviously domestic foreign and alien insurers, insurance companies are classified to the location of incorporation. Regardless of where an insurance company is incorporated, it must obtain a certificate of authority before transacting insurance within the state. As you, if these three are very important, they will ask you in the test. Domestic insurance and insurance company that is incorporated in the state. A foreign insurance and insurance company uh, where that is incorporated in another state or territory possession, such as Puerto Rico, Guam, or American Samonia. And alien insurance and insurance company that is incorporated outside of the United States, just like I stated with Lloyds of London. Financial status, independent rating services. There's rating services where we rate insurance companies. Uh, AM Best, Pit Fitch is one of them. Go on to the next page. Uh, st uh, Standard and Poor's, Moody's and Vs. The AM Best is most you'll see in insurance company and other ones you'll rarely see them, but you will see them as well. Marketing distribution system. Insurance companies market the products in different ways through agent or direct uh, solicitation to the customer. Types of marketing arrangements is independent agency system, American agency system, exclusive agency system, captive agents, as you can see their characteristics are over here, general agency system, managerial system, and direct response marketing system. Obviously, these are, these are the, uh, uh, you know, through you work through agents or direct solicitation to the customer. Insurance companies are either ownership, domicile, authority, marketing distribution, and rating financial status. And all these over here are connected to each of these specific items. Reinsurance is a contract in which one insurance company, the reinsurer, indemnifies another insurance company for part of all of its liabilities. The purpose of reinsurance is to protect insurers against catastrophic losses. The organizing company the originating company that, pro that, that procures insurance and itself from another insurer is called the seeding insurer. Keep that in mind. Agents and rules of agency. Let's go over here. The reason I'm not going everything, I want to go over certain things that at least, uh, uh, you know, like go over certain important items. So hopefully, you know, help out. Going over everything will be too much and obviously it's going to be too much of work to go over. 
An agent producer in an individual license to sell, solicit, or negotiate insurance contract on behalf of the principal insurer, the law of agency defines the relationship between the principal and the agent producer. The act of the agent producer within the scope of authority are deemed to be act of the insurer. In this relationship, it is given that an agent represents the insurer, not the insured. Any knowledge of the agent is presumed to be knowledge of the insurer. If the agent is working with a condition in his or her contract, the insurer is fully responsible. When the, when the insured submits the uh, payment of the agent, it is as submitting a payment to the insurer. The agent is responsible for accurately completing application for insurance, submitting the application to the insurer for underwriting and delivering the policy to the policy owner. If you're an agent, you see there's a difference between an agent and a broker, for those people that don't know. I apologize for this page I was reading from. If you're an agent, you, you will actually uh, basically, how can I say it? As an agent, you represent the insurance company because you're loyal to one company. Let's say if you're working with Allstate, you're working with State Farm, you're working with Geico. You will sell Allstate, you will sell Geico, you will sell State Farm. You cannot go and sell any other insurance company. You cannot go and, uh, and uh, become a broker. That's where the broker is. A broker does not have one insurance company. Broker represents every insurance company. Agent represents one insurance company. That's where the difference is. Some insurance, what you will do, let's say for example, let's say if you're working with State Farm. Let's say if you cannot get the customer State Farm, then you could check other options to help out that customer. But you're limited to the insurance company. As a broker, you're not limited. You are unlimited. Any insurance company that, that actually has a binding contract with you, you could use them. You could even work with another broker for as, uh, having another broker and actually make a deal with that broker and co share commissions. That's how you're able to do it. But an agent is not able to do that. Agent can also share commission, but with only with, the, uh, with themselves, with let's say another same company. Now, there are three types of agent authority, express, implied, and apparent. Keep this in mind, these are questions that comes in the test. Express authority is the authority of a principal and tends to grant to an agent by means of the agent contract. It is authority that is written in the contract. Implied authority is written that is not expressed or written into the contract but which the agent is assumed to have in order to transact the business. For example, collecting money even though you are not given the authority to do so. That's what implied. Keep this in mind. Express implied. They do give you, uh, you know, uh, questions during the test. Apparent authority, also known as perceived authority, is the appearance or presumption of authority based on the action, words, or deeds of the principal or because of circumstances the principal created. For example, if an agent uses an insurance statutory when soliciting coverage, an applicant may believe that the agent is authorized to transact insurance on behalf of the insurance. Although the agent acts as an insurer, they are legally obligated to treat applicant and insurer in an ethical manner. So that's, the, that's one thing. Fiduciary responsibility is someone in the position of trust. So basically you are in the fiduciary responsibility because the insurer, in the insurer trusts you. Market Conducts Market conduct describes the way companies and producers should conduct their business. It is the code of ethics for producers. To keep this in mind, let's go over to contract. A contract is an a a agreement between two or more parties, enforceable by law. So let's say if you want, want you want insurance, you and the insurance company are in a contract. So elements of legal contract these include these four stages: agreement, offer, and acceptance, consideration, competent parties, and legal purposes. So he have that in mind. Offer and acceptance is basically uh, offered by one party, and the other party must accept uh, the exact terms. So that's what it is. Consideration is basically, let's say, uh, the binding force in a contract is the consideration. Consider is something the value that each party given to the other. Competent parties, the parties to a contract must be capable of entering into a contract in the eyes of the law. Generally, that requires that both parties be legal age, 14 and a half in New York, mentally competent to understand the contract and not under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So if you're not competent, then you'll not be able to do any type of work. So let's say, for example, if you have an in insured that comes to your office and he's actually intoxicated and tell them, I want a life insurance policy for $1 million, well, guess what? You can't do it. Why? Because he was not competent. He was intoxicated. He was drinking. Because of that, he was unable to get the, get the insurance. That's what, that's what competent means. 
Legal purpose, the purpose of the contract must be legal and not against any public policy. To ensure legal purpose of a life insurance policy, for example, it must have both insurable interest and consent. A contract without a legal purpose is considered void, so keep that in mind. Uh, character of attention. A character of attention is prepared by one of the party in shorter and accepted or rejected by the other party. So it's quite simple. So if you give one thing and the other party accepts or rejects it, it's contract of attention. Aliatry contract, these insurable contracts are aliatry, which means that there is an exchange of unequal amount of value. So that's one part of aliatry contract. The premium paid by the insured is small in relation to the amount that will be paid by the insured in the event of a loss. So keep, let's say for example, life insurance policy. You took an $80,000 life insurance policy, but you pay every every month $100. And something happens to you after three years, you will get you will have $80,000 worth of value because that's where the aliatry contract works. That's what it basically means. You pay a small amount, you get a big amount. 13. Uh, property and casualty examples. Let's go to personal contract. Uh, these examples, you can pause the video and read it. Because there's so many examples and so much work to read, and it becomes so long of the video, I uh, shortened it down just to go over like I stated before important terms. Uh, personal contract in insurance in general, insurance contract is a personal contract because it's between the insurance company and an individual. Keep that in mind. Un these contracts are important as well, so please uh, read on your contracts. Unilateral contract is a contract only one of the parties to be contract is legally bound to do anything. The insurer makes no legally binding promises. However, an insurer is legally bonded to pay for laws covered by a policy in force. Conditional contract is basically requires that certain conditions must be met by the policy owner and the company in order for the contract to be executed and before each party fulfills its obligation. For example, they give you that insurer must make the premium and provide proof of loss in order to insure to cover a claim. Indemnity is basically sometimes referred to as reimbursement. Is a provision in an insurance policy that states that in event of a loss, an insured or a beneficiary is permitted to collect only to the extent of the financial loss and is not allowed to gain financially because of the existence of an insurance contract. The purpose of insurance is to restore but not let an insured or beneficiary profit from the loss. So basically, they're saying that if something happens, they will give you the loss, whatever you, 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 you're paying for. They will cover that amount. They will not give you anything extra, or if they find out you're doing anything illegal. They will not give you the, 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 the premium or money they were supposed to give you. Outmost good faith. We're almost done, guys. This is the second to last page. The principle of outmost good faith implies that when there is no fraud, when, 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 when that there will be no fraud, mispresentation, or concealment between the parties. That's what outmost good faith means, that you trust in them. You trust the company, the company trusts you. Representation in, in, in statement believed to be true to the best of one's uh, knowledge, representation. So keep that in mind. But not but they are not granted to be true. So that's representation. Uh, mispresentation is basically a material mispresentation statement that if discovered were also the underwriting decision of the insurance company. For example, you're burning your own house down with a lighter. That's mispresentation. A warranty is an absolute and true statement upon what the validity of an insurance policy depends. Breach of warranty can be considered grounds for awarding the policy in return of the premium. So keep that in mind. Last page. Recession. The, uh, the Basically, when an insurance applicant intentionally fails to communicate information from the insurance needs, the insurance has the right to cancel the policy even if the failure to communicate is discovered after the policy has been issued. This act is called recession. Concealment is a legal term of the intentional withholding of information from material fact that is crucial to making a decision. That's concealment, you're hiding something. Fraud, common sense, is something that uh, you misrepresentation facts to, to insurance company or to somebody else to make something void. Waiver is a voluntary act or declaration of legal right. Uh, estoppel is legal. This is important. Estoppel. Actually, they do ask you a question on the test. Estoppel is a legal process that can be used to prevent a party to a contract from reasserting rights to privilege after the right of uh, after the right or privilege has been waived. So that's what that's what estoppel is. With that said guys, thank you guys for listening to this video. I know it was boring. I know it wasn't that really good fun to listen to, but hopefully I tried my best. 
uh, the reason for these key terms are for it's for you to help out for you to learn these key terms are very important mostly general questions are asked on these key terms especially in the property and casualty broker and the life insurance life health and accident insurance policy as well including the personal line broker slash agent test general terms are asked everywhere in any of the parts of the test so always better to know and not to know you need to score high at least in the general part to give you at least a head start when you take the test uh, that said guys thank you again for watching this video if you have any questions at all about this or anything else feel free to contact me i'll try my best to help you guys out as much as possible thank you again guys for watching this video and i hope you guys enjoyed it